He is worthy, amen? He is so worthy of our praise this morning. And uh, I pray that whether you worked in with something hard on your heart and difficult, or you're rejoicing, that you would understand that He is worthy of our praise. And we owe Him glory and thanks for all He is and who He is in our lives. Would you pray with me as we get ready for this morning's message? Lord, we thank you that we get to worship an awesome God. You are incredible, Father. You pour out your love. You pour out your grace. You pour out your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we say thank you. Father, we pray that we would trust you more, that we would be more obedient. Father, we cry out to you with heavy hearts, Lord, for those walking through a difficult season, God. There are people in Florida that have experienced great devastation this last week. Lord, we pray that they would just be surrendering to you. They'd cry out to you, and you'd show them your, your blessing and your favor and your protection, Lord. For those grieving around the world for lost ones or sick ones, Lord, would they cry out to you, an awesome God, and they experience your presence and they would fully surrender and trust you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, in our lives, may we do that more. As we look to your word for guidance and for truth, would you speak into us, Lord? Would you allow us to walk out of here more in love with you, Father, and that we would shine with the love of Christ in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our schools. God, wherever you call us to, that we be used for your glory. We love to praise you because you are holy, God. Thank you for loving us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, go ahead and pull them out. We're going to be in the book of Amos this morning, and we're in the, uh, walking through some of the minor prophets, and a lot of people think, oh, they're minor, don't need to spend much time there, they're not important, but they are important. There's so much to dig into, and we're in the third week of looking at some of these minor prophets, and uh, the one we're going to look at today, did anybody, anyone else grow up with a fear of just kind of feeling like you might be unpopular, and that childhood fear of all the things that you did and said? And, you know, maybe the way you dress might cause that fear. Well, I, gotta, I was reading a story in a book that maybe you f- could relate to. I know I could relate to as well. That you think about your first car and you're like, man, that was not a very cool car. It would not make me very cool, okay? So I want to tell you this story. It says this person, she said that she grew up in her family that didn't have a lot of money. And so she thought she never had the coolest name brand clothes. One year, my parents bought me, she said, two pairs of jeans, okay? Two pairs of Sears Tufkin jeans for school. And she had a brown pair and a, and a blue pair. And all the cool kids had Levi's, either silver or red tabs, and Nikes to match. I had two pairs of Tufkins and one pair of Stride Right tennis shoes that had to last the entire year. Both of the jeans wore holes in the seat area, so my mom, who was big into cross-stitching, sewed an American flag patch over one and a uh, Indian head over the other. And I can still, to this day, remember people pledging allegiance to my rear and calling me Tonto. And I vowed that whatever happened that day, I would never want to face that kind of rejection and pain again. I don't know if you've ever, you know, experienced feeling unpopular, uncool. You know, friends, a lot of us have. And I got to tell you, I I heard a story even about somebody who was um, getting married and they were, the bride's family was all coming to the wedding. And so they wanted to think they had a lot of friends and they paid 200 people to show up to their, their, sit on their side so the bride's family would think, wow, he's got a lot of friends. He paid him 12 bucks a pop, right, for them to sit there. You know, it makes me wonder how desperate you got to be to have friends in order to pay them to be at your wedding. But the thing is, I want you to see today is we are going to look at a prophet today, Amos, who was incredibly unpopular, okay? This is famous Amos, you know, one of the most despised men in Israel, and he had some, you know, popular cookies after him, and that's where it pretty much dropped off, okay? So if you open your Bibles today to Amos, uh, we're going to be looking at this this book. A couple things I want you to note about Amos. First of all, uh, he's unlike the other prophets in that he really didn't get paid to be a prophet. He wasn't a vocational prophet. He was an average worker. 
worker every day, blue collar person who was a cattle farmer in his, chapter one, it tells us. He also would tend a field of sycamore trees. That's what Amos did. And he didn't go to seminary to learn to write sermons. He just felt when God pressed upon his heart so much, he had to speak up. He couldn't be silent anymore. And that's what Amos does. So he's a very ordinary person. And here's the connection. I want you to know that God's used ordinary people all throughout Christian history. One of the people I want to highlight to you is a guy named William Booth. He was a, uh, a lay person in a church, and he started the Salvation Army, and Salvation Army has become one of the most important care centers for the poor in urban centers. I grew up in Kansas City. We would go down to the Salvation Army uh, Center multiple times a year, and they have a wonderful worship service. There was a men's shelter. We'd feed them a meal, and then they would get classes on how to get out of drug addictions and, and to, to really pull out of that. That. And so that was started by a lay person. And I just want you to know that's one of my heart's prayers for this church too, that God will raise up more Amoses, that you just use the gifts that God's given you and you'll, you'll be passionate to serve the Lord how God has called you to be. And the second thing I want to show you about the, the reason he was so unpopular is because he was prophesying and bringing a message of warning during a time of great prosperity, okay? So to help you get this, it was about 800 BC. Jeroboam II was king at the time, and Israel was still basically just loaded in prosperity because of the seasons of David and Solomon. That's where they're coming out of. And so they had incredible military power. They had controlled all the trade routes. Things were good. Stock market was up. And Amos shows up with this warning that, hey, things financially are not going to look so good. There's going to be disaster. There's going to be even military destruction. And that's what they couldn't believe. They're like, this is unbelievable. This is, there's no way we can really grasp what you're talking about here. How could that happen? I want to give you quickly two examples of this. Um, chapter 2, verse 15, it says this. It says, the archer will not stand his ground, and he who is stout of heart among the mighty men shall flee away naked in that day, declares the Lord. Okay, here's what that means. Israel's archers were a big deal, okay? They were uh, significant. They were a source of national pride. They had incredible uh, valor. They, had, they were tough. They were amazing marksmen. And it's saying these, these, these warriors were not holding their post. And in fact, in fact, it goes on to say they will flee away naked in that day. That's like saying, you know what, our Navy SEALs are going to run away and hide in the corner crying like a baby. I mean, that's kind of what he's saying. They're not even standing their post. That's what he's saying. Another example of this, chapter 3, verse 15, if you want to follow over there, it says this, I will strike the winter house along with the summer house and the house of ivory shall perish, declares the Lord. Okay. If you have three houses, you, you know, they were doing living in such a time that things were so good financially that they had a winter house, they had a summer house, they had their main house. And if you have three houses, let me tell you, things are going pretty well, right? So you're like, how are they going to take out my summer house? And things are going to take out my winter house, take out this. And they're like, this just can't be. It's unbelievable that this kind of disaster would come along. And they thought it was just unrealistic. So they, he wasn't very popular. And I got to tell you, mighty empires, mighty women, mighty men, I'm telling you, they don't usually get brought down by financial disaster. They don't usually get brought down by military power. They usually get brought down by sin, right? It's corruption from the inside. And that's what's going on in Israel. That's what they're dealing with. So we're going to take a look at this message today. And I just want to tell you, the first six chapters of Amos are all basically one long sermon, okay? He's just preaching at them, teaching at them, and this is what he has. So the first thing, I'm going to break this down into sections that we see. The first thing I want you to see, the charge that Amos is going to give the people of God. This you can find in chapters 1 and 2. What Amos did is he stood in the center of the, you know, one of the national holidays, people gathered all around, and he stood at the center of Israel, one of Israel's most important cities, Bethel, proclaiming God's judgment on six nations around them that were not their friends, okay? They were their enemies. He says Damascus and Philistia, and then he says God's judgment is going to come upon them. Well, you can imagine if you were in that crowd, you're like, 
That was well received, right? They were like, yes, bring it on. Because if you want to, the quickest way you want to make friends with someone is talk bad about the same person, right? If you talk bad about them and they talk bad about them, then it's like, hey, we can be friends. I don't care what you think, what you, you know, that, they, that's what will buddy you up. So if you can imagine this crowd of believers was out there and they're like, amen, preach it, you know, keep preaching judgment on our neighborly friends. Um, and so and then chapter two, what happens is he pivots and he starts talking about Israel's sin. And that's where it didn't get, go over quite as well, if you can imagine. He talks about them, and they're standing right in front of him, a little bit awkward to be preaching about their sins right in front of him. So he does this actually in third person. He's going to say, you know what, uh, this is a charge against Israel, it is in third person. I'm going to give you a couple of these, act, these uh, charges that he makes. First of all, chapter, six, I mean, uh, chapter 2 of verse 6 says this, they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. So this is the first thing he says they're doing wrong. He says they're exploiting the poor, okay? Silver was a symbol during this day of an extreme debt, okay, a huge debt. And I want to tell you, the, the world's economy was kind of changing during this time. During Amos' day, it went from just small farmers and just kind of raising up what you had and selling it off to make money. All of a sudden, it became more of a mass producing, and, and they had to have specialize in certain crops, cash crops, and, and other people caught on a little bit faster. And what happened is a few people started to figure out how they could rig the system, and cause inflation, and it started putting other smaller farmers into debt, major, major debt, and so much that they even, in order to buy a pair of shoes to get by with their daily stuff, they had to go into debt. And I want you to know, there was no, you know, just bankruptcy back then. You didn't just get it all wiped out. If you had a debt back then, you didn't make monthly payments. If you had a deep debt, you had to go into servitude. That's what they're talking about here. He continues on in verse 6 says, they trample the head of the poor into dust of the earth. That means that they started to use their affluence and their power to actually change the court systems. And that's what he's going to refer to later on in, in chapter 5. He's saying, you're using your court system, your, your power to keep people down and those in poverty really broken, no chance. Continues on in verse 7, and they turn aside the way of the afflicted. In other words, they're just apathetic towards them. They don't really, really hear. They're just so built up in their lives of ease and luxury and comfort that they don't notice all those people suffering right around them. And I just want to quickly point out to you that God says, you know what, this is a breach of justice. Okay, God throughout the Old Testament is actually going to use the word justice over 200 times. And he says to not care for and not look around to those that are poor and broken would be an actual injustice. And scripture mostly refers to it in four categories. It refers to it as widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. That's what we would see according to Deuteronomy 18. Here's the verse that says, he executes justice for the fatherless, the widow, he, and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. And so justice isn't just putting down the oppressors, it's also lifting up those who are walking through a season of oppressed, being oppressed. And so in Amos's day, you know, they saw their riches as theirs. This is my riches. This is what I get to use. This is what I get to kind of control. And they were oblivious to all those around them that had need. I want to share with you probably a very unpolitical, unpopular statement that he had to preach into them. Chapter 4, verse 1, if you have your Bibles, this is what he says. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. Okay, he refers to the housewives of Israel here as cows of Bashan, okay? He calls them cows. And so, you know, it may not translate exactly to what it was today, but can you imagine that's pretty offensive, right? He's saying these, are, these women are living off their husband's wealth and their poverty, and they're, they're using their resources to get what they want and living in luxury and not noticing those around them that are suffering, so back to this description in chapter 2, verse 7. 
Also, I want to point out to you, they became very complacent with kind of this sexual revolution that was going on. So in their day, in this community, there was kind of a, a, a sexual revolution going on. And he points out to them, God's people are just not, go, they're going along with it. They're not speaking out against it. The preacher's no longer preaching against that, you know? And so that's what he says, that's not good. That's a high concern. Verse 9, I want to go there for a second. He charges Israel with this. Verse 9 through basically 12, if you have your Bibles in chapter 2. This may be the worst part of it all. It says this, Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorites before you, and it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you for 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorites. In other words, he's saying here, I saved you by grace. And now you're responding to me by ignoring me and also ignoring those around you, exploiting the, those that are living in poverty around you. He also went on to say in verse 12, he says, I raised you up some sons for profit, but you commanded the prophet saying, you shall not prophesy. In other words, I was good when you wanted me to deliver you, but now all of a sudden you don't want to know what I have to say. He told I raised up some sons that should be proclaiming the word of the Lord, and all of a sudden, you're, you're telling them to be quiet, to, to not speak, and that's what they're doing. And most frustrating, I think, to the Lord was Amos went on to say that they're doing this all while keeping their fervent religious devotion. In other words, they kept coming to church and acting like nothing's happening. They just ignored it, friend, and, and that's what they, the prophet Isaiah prophesied. Right after Amos, he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I don't know how many times we come to church and we just sing and we sing so loud, but friend, our devotion to the Lord is really what we, how we live throughout the week, right? That's how we serve him. And this, you got to imagine in this section of the sermon, the amens probably died down a lot, didn't they? You know, all of a sudden, it was when he preaching judgment against the, the other nations. He's like, amen, amen. And then all of a sudden, it got a little quieter. It kind of reminds me of a story of a, um, uh, a woman who went to church, and you know, she was so excited that her pastor was going to be preaching on the judgment of sin. And so he was so fired up, and you know, uh, she was, he started preaching about you know, uh, sexual mis uh, givings and also maybe drunkenness, and she was shouting, amen, amen. And then she, he started preaching on, you know, the political system and, you know, what's going on in, in, in the government and Washington today. And she started saying, shouting, amen, you know, the pastor's on fire today, right? And then he started preaching about gossip. And she said, uh, you know, he needs to just keep his mouth shut. You know, he, he's going a little too long today, right? You know, we kind of don't want to talk about those things. So the, how do we bridge what we hear here in this warning from Amos's day to our day? Friends, I got to tell you, I could probably preach all day about moral corruption. And you'd be like, amen. And I could preach about, you know, violence towards women. Or I could preach about, you know, how uh, masculinity is being driven out of our society. I could preach about, you know, the secularist agenda and, and activist judges that are not giving us our religious freedoms. And, and how the fathers aren't stepping up in so many communities. I could preach all about corruption and hypocrisy and get amen after amen. But the thing is, what happens when we start preaching like Israel did about their sins and our sins? You know what? We live in a country where justice is, you know, perverted, right? By those who have so much. And Christians, think about how many Christians actually justify abortion at times. Friends, we think, you know, well, what if she had had that baby? She wouldn't have been able to go to, to college and it would have changed everything. She was the first one to graduate. And, and we get these, but really, is that how we're justifying taking a human life? Someone made in the image of God? We do this all the time today with so many sins, friend. You know, we, we think, oh, just let that go and let that go and don't talk about that. And we do it about, you know, giving. You know, uh, Christians should be setting the standard. We, God has blessed us to use those resources for his giving. But a lot of times we hold back and we're not sure, Lord, that's a large amount. I don't know if I can really give you all of that. Friend, it, it, we do that. You know, it's dangerous for us. 
We have to address some of these things that God wants to address in our lives and in our com- community as well. And so, friends, that's what we, we, we talk about. We love, we're good with talking about other people's sins, but when it comes to ours, you know what? It gets a little bit uncomfortable. And I want you to know, uh, I understand if I preach about these sins, it's not going to make me popular. I get that, okay? And, and you know, I, there's people that you know, may want to you know, walk out of here. There's too much. This is too difficult. But here's the, fr- the reason we have to. is because God makes it very clear to Amos. If you want my presence, you have to take sin seriously. And, and we can't, people that treat sin lightly and don't take God seriously, friend, you're alienating Christ and we cannot do that. So I want you to see as we proceed on, there's also always going to be some counterfeits and you cannot listen and give in to the counterfeits. So chapter seven, uh, verses 10 and 11 kind of point this out. You see, Amos wasn't the only one in his day prophesying for the Lord. There was another preacher from a big church, okay, in a big community, and he was preaching as well. And this is what it says. His name was Amaziah, okay? Amos chapter 7, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to hear all his words. So this other preacher comes and says to Amaziah, you know what? Uh, He's being a troublemaker. He's causing disruption. He's talking about things that are uncomfortable. And he convinced Jeroboam to banish Amos from the land. Now, one thing I just want to point out here real quickly. I want you to know there will always be preachers that are ready to tell this generation whatever they want to hear. Okay, there are going to be preachers. And I got to tell you, I'm up here telling you I am not the perfect preacher, okay? I have a lot of blind spots. And and, and the thing I want to ask of you is that you would pray for me. Pray that I would have clarity and boldness to continue to preach God's word because that's what we do here, friend. We preach through God's word because we have to lift it up because it speaks to us. And it's going to teach us and preach to us about things that, you know what, may be a little bit uncomfortable, I could pick topics every week that we would love to hear and we rah, you know, rah, 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 and excited about. But friend, God's word, if we preach through the whole of God's word, it's going to deal with some subjects that God wants to deal with us, that I may have blind spots to, we may have blind spots to. So let me tell you, I understand it's not going to make me popular. It's not going to make our church popular, you know, by preaching the whole of Scripture. But friend, we cannot give in to the pressures of culture. We cannot. And friend, I pray that God would not make us a church like I, over the last couple of years, we've talked about Revelations chapter 2. And God said there was a church in Revelation chapter 2 that was faithful to God in every way except that they tolerated and taught and and practiced sexual immorality. That was the only thing. And Jesus, it says, removed himself from that church. Friend, I don't want to be a church that is like that. We have to stand for God's word. We have to preach all of it. And I'm telling you, preaching sins that affect some of us will not make us popular. But friend, I cannot give up and lose the presence of Jesus. We will stand for the presence of Jesus. We want more of Jesus in this church. And that means it's, at times it's going to be uncomfortable. So I want you to know, we cannot, there will always be counterfeits. There will always be, we have to pray that we are open to the Holy Spirit. We remain faithful to God's word and scripture. And that, you know, we also pray that we would share the good word with other believers. Because we were, we're comfortable talking about other sins, but friend, things God has to deal with in our lives. Real quickly, I want to tell you, there's a couple excuses that pop up. And he's going to, Israel made some defenses of why they were doing what they were doing. So chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, if you want to look at there, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 talks about, first of all, they said, God, we're your people. We're your followers. We're your chosen people. That's what they they cried out to him. They're like, we're Israel. You know, we're your people. And he says to them in verse 2, he says, that makes your sin even worse. He says, not only do you understand that I gave you the law, but you understood me as a, as a father and, and as your redeemer. And so that I'm going to hold you even more accountable is what he says to that first reason. He's like, you know, that was their first excuse. We're your people. You can't, you know, uh, turn against us. 
And the second one is they did a church a lot, okay? They said that basically they would do church so much that it would cover, cover up for their moral shortcomings. I'm telling you, they went during Amos' day to church all the time. They had festivals and feasts all the time. And this is what God says to them. Chapter 5, verse 21 says to them about their religious zeal. He says, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. In other words, we can't excuse ourselves just because of grace. You know, well, thank God he accepts us by grace. Amen. And we understand we're not perfect. We're just forgiven. But friend, if we were really understanding the gospel and the grace of Jesus Christ and all that we've been forgiven of in our sinful lives, then we would be willing to extend that to those around us. We would look around and say, hey, I've got something I can bless you with. I can take care of that. I can step up in your life. Christians, would, we shouldn't be passive to the ideas of hunger and, and sickness and oppression. We shouldn't be passive to that. The other thing is, is we can become very lazy as Christians. Chapter 6, verse 1 and Amos says this, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Woe to those who are taking it easy in the kingdom of God. That's another word for Zion. So as Christians, we just get lazy at times. I found a, I found a sermon by uh, Charles Spurgeon that talked about chapter 6, verse 1. And it had these three areas of how we get lazy. First of all, he said there's those that get apathetic. That means that we just, we just really don't care. It's, it's not we're trying to be cruel or vicious. It's just we don't think that much about those going through difficult seasons around us. The second one, he said, can get lazy, are those that get self-indulgent, he called it. So basically, you care so much about what you've got, the stuff you've got, that you really don't take the idea of sacrificing anything for those around you. And the third one, he said, is that we can become procrastinators. You know, we want to do good. We long to do good. We're supposed to do good. But the thing is, we actually don't do it. We have great intentions, but we never act on those intentions. So he's giving this caution, woe to you who are taking it easy in the kingdom of God. Now, I, I want you to know, People, there are people all around the world that do not know about the love of Jesus Christ. And I got to tell you, as a church, we are involved in these ministries that care for and extend the gospel to the poor and to the broken. This is a beautiful thing. You're going to hear more about these over the next couple of weeks, opportunities to really step up in this area. But I want you to know, we, have, we support a ministry called Haggai Ministry. They're going to be here the first week in November. And it's an incredible ministry that shares and teaches people how to share the gospel. And I got to tell you, I just got an email two days ago that told me a new class has started with people, uh, 44 around, people around 44 different countries attending this class um, through uh, Zoom, okay? So virtual classes. But the coolest thing is, is one of the instructors that actually helps teach these classes is actually doing this from the bomb shelter in Ukraine. Do you get that, friend? Do we even think about how blessed, how, how, how much we have? And this person is in the, the bomb shelter of Ukraine teaching others from other countries how to share the gospel. Friend, we have a role to play in this. God wants to cause us to step up. We can't get lazy in this. We have a responsibility to share the gospel, to care for those that are, are broken. I want to tell you one last area that there is false hope and there is true hope. And I want to look at this. So where did that leave all of Israel, what they were going through and how that happened to them? Listen to this. This is what happened to them. In chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, if you have the book of Amos, it says this, This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, a basket of summer fruit. And then a little bit further, it says, Then the Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel, and I will never again pass by them. He says, He comes, behold, a basket of summer fruit. Do you know what summer fruit is? Summer fruit is like this. 
overripe fruit. Okay, friend? I mean, this is, you know, it looks good. It looks kind of yellow, but it's pretty squishy as well. And if you were to take a bite of this, you would regret it immediately, right? Probably ruin your appetite for the whole day. That's what overripe fruit is. It looks good on the outside. And that's what he's saying. You guys look good on the outside, but your core, you are ripe for God's judgment. And so that's what he's telling them. That's what I see is overripe fruit. And then in verse, chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, this is what he says. He says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you desire the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Friend, if you're running from a lion and you're running into a bear, that's not a good day, is it? That is not a good day. He's saying, you guys are always asking for the Lord to come back. Oh, you know, Jesus, come back. Would you come? Would you return? And we get so excited that he's saying, why do you want that? It's not a good day for you because you're not taking your sin seriously. You haven't truly repented of your heart. He's saying it's going to be more like a day of judgment and rapture. So why? It's going to be like darkness, he says. And you're running into literally the bear of of Jesus' judgment. That is not good news for us to have just the outside looking good. We need to truly repent to the Lord. And we need to hear the good news. The good news is, just like I talked about last week, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is talked about all the time. He mentions it almost five times here in Amos. And the day of the Lord is where Jesus took on the judgment for our sins for us on the cross, leaving us protection. We are protected under the shelter of the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are left with his goodness and his blessing. That's what we are left with. And it reminds me of a hymn. I don't know if some of you love hymns, and I I love the hymns too. There's one called Rock of Ages. And maybe you've heard that, Rock of Ages. You know, I love that one. It was written by an Englishman named Augustus Toplady, and he was in the first year of the American Revolution, 1776. And he was out in the fields of England, and suddenly this massive storm came over him. It was lightning and thunder, and all of a sudden, hail started pouring down. Well, he saw off in the distance this massive rock, this huge boulder, and he ran towards it. And as he got closer to it, he realized that another rock through an earthquake had come and smashed that rock to where there was a crack, a crease in it, enough for him to fit down in it. And as he was completely inside of this rock and he was seeing hail all outside of him, he started thinking about God's coming judgment and the fact that Jesus, like the rock of ages, was broken by God so that sinners like ourselves who hide in him might be safe. And he took out a playing card. They said it was an ace of spades and he wrote on it, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Friend, as you hide yourself in in the covering and the blood of Jesus Christ, as you repent of your sins, friend, there is blessing and there is goodness for you. And here's what real repentance looks like. I'm going to end with this verse. Chapter 5 has a couple verses, verses 14 and 15 and verses 23 and 24. This is what repentance looks like. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. And as you have said... Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gates. Verse 23, take away from me the noise of your songs and the melody of of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice roll down like mighty waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Friend, this is what it looks like to surrender to the Lord Jesus that we would be his hands and feet, sharing the love and the grace and how he's blessed us with much he's given, much will be required so that we could be a blessing to those around us in need. There are many more that need to hear about the love of Jesus. I pray that we would be a church that takes it seriously. We would have the boldness to preach about sins that we're struggling with too so that we could understand the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, we just, um, I pray for boldness.
I pray that we would have boldness to to speak your word and stay close to your word and and grow in your word, that you would shape us and mold us, that we would uh, address areas, Father, that you see in our lives that you want to speak your truth into. So, Father, give us boldness to be about the things of, of the word of God. I also pray, Father, for courage to really surrender to you, to find our refuge in you, your goodness, Lord, and your protection and your blessing as we come as one who is surrendered to the love of Jesus Christ in our lives. So, Father, I pray that we would do that today. God, we love you. It's You are incredibly good, incredibly gracious. Now, use us throughout this week to shine with the love of Christ, that it wouldn't be something we just sing loudly on Sundays, but we walk out of here and boldly live out the gospel wherever we go. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So good to worship with you this morning. I pray that God uh, will really bless you this week as you cry out to him and surrender to him. Uh, I'll encourage you to fellowship with one another. If you have any questions, you can always go by the Welcome Center on your way out as well. Hear the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed week.